after the first semester was all about New York City. Um, so um, the 43 students are working in places like Hudson, New York, Kingston, New York, and then we have a group of uh, students working in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and all through the lens of the Green New Deal, trying to develop urban design scenarios that address the climate crisis um, together with, with the racial justice crisis and the public health crisis that we're currently in and sort of find intersections there. And it's part of a larger framework um, that um, the Landscape Architecture Foundation has put together this year, where across the entire country, design studios are working on this framework called the um, Green New Deal Super Studio. So the idea is to develop uh, lots of ideas of how this uh, policy concept could be translated into physical space. We've been invited into some other studios across the country. I can imagine that <laughs> you're very popular with this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and Robert and um, Elizabeth, I teach, uh, as I said before, a corporate sustainability course at uh, uh, the Graduate School of International and Public Affairs. And the course is essentially an, a survey course on the underpinnings and elements of corporate sustainability. Uh, the underpinnings being the mindset, the broader philosophical perspectives that, that businesses need to actually optimize an integrated bottom line of environmental, social, and economic performance. And the elements, as I tell my students, are the things that a chief sustainability officer needs to do Monday morning at nine o'clock to move a company in this direction. So that includes um, product and process design, uh, stakeholder engagement, uh, access to financing, uh, just about every aspect of a business has a sustainability dimension. And one of the new exciting areas is businesses beginning to assess their uh, ecological footprint, uh, not only carbon, but also impact on biodiversity, not just to assess it for the sake of assessing it, but also to, to actually minimize that impact over time so that they can indeed enhance their environmental and social performance. Uh, so we, when I heard about the, um, uh, the urban design studio and the super studio, I was ecstatic at the opportunity to collaborate, to bring my students in to explore public policy options to support the projects that the urban design studio is working on. And then also to consider business development opportunities that could fit within the conceptual and physical framework of the various design projects. So that, this is our first exercise in doing it this year. And the first session, we, uh, we listened to the preliminary presentations from the design students. And now today we have uh, you wonderful guest speakers. And then uh, you'll hear a brief presentation from one of the urban design teams and from two of my students who worked on a project that is related to that particular urban design project. So now it's, it's just about 2.10. Kaya, do you wanna kick off the official meeting? Well, I'll just I'll just briefly introduce Rob and Elizabeth, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and then we'll if you guys want to share slides, that's great. I'm just so delighted to have you join us today because we're we're at the point in the semester, as you can imagine, being being educators yourself and and, and um, designers, you know, we're trying to uh, think about what the Green New Deal looks like on the ground, and we're looking for some inspiring visions that really cut across sectors. And when I think about like the imagination that's involved in bringing about something like the Green New Deal, like you guys are just come to mind in the first thought because um, this land art generator initiative that you've created like brings together art and technology in a way to, uh, to really show like what a, a green future can be. And so I'm just really excited for you to share with our students. So maybe, you know, if you don't mind talking a little bit about how you came to this work, um, because I don't want to give a lengthy introduction of your resumes and so forth, but uh, um, and then what what you're working on now would be great. And uh, just so glad you're here. So thanks for joining. Super. Thank thanks for having us. Um, we're going to go ahead and share our screen. And uh, we have 30 minutes. So we're going to just jump into it. Um, and what we'll do is provide some cultural context historic context to why we're doing what we're doing, and then sort of give you a broad overview of the different layers of programming we have here at the Land Art Generator. 
So at the beginning, we're, we're, we're really trying to bring together a lot of siloed disciplines to be greater than the sum of their parts. Um, art and public space, energy systems, energy landscapes, um, the idea of living buildings and cities that close the loop on their energy and waste streams and bringing that all together. Um, super quick like history context here. If you go back to the beginning of electrification, all of our power plants were located right in the hearts of our cities because we couldn't raise the voltage high enough to transmit efficiently over long distances. So you've got power plants that have been um, repurposed into museums like the Tate Modern, but they were designed by architects and they had art and incorporated into them and everybody knew where their energy came from. Um, even at the time, you, you can see um, really beautiful examples of, of art and culture integrated into wind turbines for, um, for, for drawing water, uh, et cetera. Um, really, integration of, of on-site energy is not new. Uh, neither is uh, microgrids. Um, this is all stuff that um, goes back to the very beginnings, and we're understanding that a little bit more. But of course, the, the form of power generation was, solar, was, was thermal and mostly coal or natural gas, and, and, and no one wants to live next to a, a coal-fired power plant, although many people still do, and that's a very big, important conversation about environmental justice. But as we were able to raise the voltage and transmit across long distances, we started to centralize and got those power plants out of the city. They lost their relationship to art and to architecture. And so now there's a very big cultural disconnect, and no one really knows where their electricity comes from. And that same centralized paradigm um, was very easily translated into the renewable energy trans the early stages of the renewable energy transition. And to be fair, um, competing against the incumbent energy sources for the cheapest kilowatt hour, uh, wind and solar needed to be stripped down and utilitarian in the approach. Um, but that's changing now. And um, these kind of utilitarian installations that you see on the screen here have often been used as an excuse for those with ulterior motives to push back, not in my backyard, for um, wind and solar power installations, for example. So that's what was on our mind when we founded the Land Art Generator in 2008 while living in Dubai. Uh, we were thinking, what's, you know, how do we move through these pinch points? And we thought the big idea is what if we could reimagine our energy landscapes as books of art, as places to take your family on a picnic, um, you know, really flipping the paradigm upside down. And uh, we could see that the possibility of this included not just the kilowatt hours of electricity, but economic development, tourism, STEAM education. Um, and we like to look at this example of what public art can do for a city. This is not a land art generator. And in fact, it's energy intensive rather than giving back kilowatt hours, but it's a great case study. So um, New York City Waterfalls was up for four months. It was a $15.5 million project to install, which is on the high end of public art, but it brought in $53 million in incremental spending over those four months. So, you know, it really shows that tremendous economic impact of public art. And we'd like to add, well, what if then it was giving back megawatt hours of clean electricity to the uh, people who live near it? Um, and that's what motivated us. We've been holding international design challenges that we're gonna give you a snapshot of. And these are a platform for interdisciplinary teams to utilize renewable energy technology as a medium for public artwork. Um, we've held these competitions around the world by invitation, uh, Dubai, New York City, Copenhagen, Santa Monica, Melbourne, Abu Dhabi, Fly Ranch. Each one of these has a unique set of private and public partners. Um, and also each of these is a different site typology. So we go from landfills to brownfield sites, uh, urban gateways, coastal, master plan sites, rural site in Nevada Fly Ranch uh, competition we just closed, um, but we also do invited competitions. So there's a wide range of ways in which we work. Um, and some of those we'll show at the end of the presentation, including participatory design projects. Um, but let's give you a snapshot of some of the outcomes from the international competitions, and then we'll move from there. By technology type, generally, here you have uh... When you close your eyes and you think of a solar panel, this is what probably pops in your mind. 
Um, and if you give the same technology to a team of engineers and artists collaborating, you get energy duck. So everybody loves a duck, right? So why not have it power your neighborhood? And what's interesting about this proposed artwork is that it is also a battery. So it stores energy by um, its buoyancy, it's a gravity battery. And at the end of the day, when uh, the cost of energy is high and um, the sun is setting and the, the people are coming home from work and you've got that energy spike, um, it, it slowly allows water into the hull of the duct through micro turbines to add some energy to the grid at that last moment um, and address the duct curve. So it's covering all sorts of bases with this artwork here conceptually. This is an example of bifacial solar panels creating these beautiful biomes. Um, they're shaped like a clutch of eggs to celebrate the importance of the Falcon to the culture of the United Arab Emirates. This is a proposal for Mass Star City from the 2019 competition. So those are both using basically monocrystal and solar panels, um, but you can think very much more creatively when you uh, think about all the technology that exists already in the world off the shelf. You can get tinted polycrystalline panels. You can get panels that have special base laminations. All of the um, beautiful custom shaped golden um, um, shapes that create this arabesque sphere are uh, that tinted polycrystalline. So this is like the most beautiful solar panel you can possibly imagine here. This is, if you look at the, um, the little um, fuchsia box there, you can see the team behind the artworks. Uh, you can see their annual capacity. And if you drop the last zero, um, you can basically get a very quick sense of how many American size um, single family homes this artwork would power, assuming 10 megawatt hours of annual consumption. And this is a beautiful um, representation of the re um, relative position of the planets around the sun on the day that the UAE was founded. So that's the concept behind the piece. And all of the spheres are using some kind of um, thin film solar technology. Here you have that custom base lamination technology being incorporated into these beautiful yellow solar rec um, power rectangles that flow off of the top of a new hotel and create a cap park over Jacka Boulevard in Melbourne, Australia. And do you want to say yeah, I just want to talk about this design site. So uh, for Loggy 2018 Melbourne, we were at a site that you can see is surrounded by the water, but also historic landmarks. Um, and it's a peculiar site because right now it's a parking lot and it's gone through multiple master planning stages. The first master planning stage was so non-inclusive of local community that when presented to the local community, all city council was voted out. Um, so it was a very dramatic, bad outcome led to a second master planning event that did include community and was more positive, but Unfortunately, the community still was very bruised by that process. So that's when we were brought in to come back to the same design site, include community and open the design competition um, to the world. But from day one, having local community participate in developing the design brief and the partnerships. So it's not surprising that the winning submission for Log 2018 Melbourne was a local team. Keep in mind that the process is 100% anonymous. So when people were voting on the jurors, they did not know that this was a local team, but it spoke to the needs of this local community. Um, and it's a tremendous outcome with a huge interdisciplinary team, including some RMIT architecture students. Here we have a desalination plant, a submission to the 2016 competition for Santa Monica. It produces four and a half billion liters of drinking water a year using 100% solar energy. And it also um, deals creatively with the downsides of desalination, which is the, um, just, um, the waste brine that is um, an, a byproduct of the process that can be dumped right into the marine ecosystem, causing incredible damage. Um, instead, this proposes a large holding tank so that the, the, the water can be released in a slow mixed mechanism, um, mixing the existing water with it to, to, to reduce the salination percentage. And that holding pond is a beautiful pool where you can go and you can float in there as if you're in the Dead Sea. 
Um, moving into even more advanced technologies that are also available um, in the market today, you've got dye-sensitized solar cells and organic photovoltaics. These are all the colors of the rainbow. They're eminently flexible, and some they can be made to be semi-translucent, as you can see in the image. So all of the pink ribbons that you see here are the solar panels themselves. And you can imagine, this is, this is the slide that we talk to people about um, going to, on a picnic to a power plant. So this would, this would power nearly 500 homes, probably more than 500 homes in Denmark um, for sure, um, and creates this beautiful place for people. So it's, it's, it's not about um, thinking of, we don't have to limit ourselves to, to focusing on just the places where we can put down um, solar panels and put them, a chain link fence, fence around them. We can actually integrate our energy systems back into population centers to great effect. Here's another example of desensitized solar cells for the pro a proposal for Logi 2019 Mazdar. Again at Mazdar City, you'll if you go and visit there, you'll find this prototype. This is a beam down tower. You're probably all very familiar with the conventional um, solar thermal um, CSP um, solar power towers um, like Ivan Pa and uh, Crescent Dunes. These are tens of thousands of mirrors focusing the sun's light to a single collector where a, a vat of salt um, flashes the molten steam or flashes uh, steam through a heat transfer uh, uh, process um, to create steam and power a turbine. It's, it's thermal energy. Um, it's just not coming from, from coal or nuclear or natural gas. It's coming directly from the power of the sun. And, and these installations are almost like unintentional works of land art because you've got all these mirrors, you've got these beams of light in the sky, and uh, definitely one of the things that inspired us originally. The exact same technology is incorporated into the winner of the 2014 competition, the Solar Hourglass by Santiago Miros Cortez. And this powers a thousand homes in the city. It's also a beautiful message talking about how there's still time to, to deal with the worst effects of climate change if we all can get together and do the right thing. So it's a positive, inspiring message. And it's a bit of a counterpoint to the climate communications that tend to be a little bit gloomy and doomy about uh, sea level rise and heat map projections and mass extinctions. And all of that is real and scary. Um, and we need to understand it. But if we dwell too much on it, then we just turn people off um, in, in terms of the political will to, to effect change. We need to give the general public something to some positive vision to run towards rather than just scary stuff to run away from. And this is the kind of, of artwork for the city that could really accomplish that. And it allows you to write, get up and touch that. Um, it's obviously protected by an insulated cylindrical piece of glass, but that beam of light, power of a thousand suns, you can really understand it. You can touch that glass and feel the heat and see how the electricity works. And it connects people culturally with the energy that they consume. This is a beautiful example of an artwork that through photovoltaic thermal technology and absorption chillers actually generates rainfall inside of this artwork just using the power of the sun in the middle of the desert. So it's an amazing uh, use of technology to create this beautiful space. Wind energy can be incorporated into civic art. These are ducted turbines, so they accelerate the speed of the wind as it hits the rotor. They haven't had a good time in the open market because it turns out you don't need to build that, that very expensive lens. You can just make the blades a little longer and you get just as much energy. But it was a fun experiment. And if you take that uh, physics principle and you bring it into land artworks, these beautiful landforms can be placed onto a hill, collecting the wind as it rushes up and concentrating it, accelerating its speed before it hits the turbine and creating beautiful calm spaces even on the windiest of days for visitors to the park. That is a summary of some of the projects that have come into past competitions. And we're I'm happy to say we've just closed the selection process on Loggy 2020 Fly Ranch, a partnership with Burning Man Project for the 3,800 acres that they own in Northern Nevada, um, just about five miles from Black Rock City, if you're familiar with the event. And the goal there is to create a year round um, place for activities, learning, creativity. And to do that, they need infrastructure because this is completely off the grid. And so they, rather than bring out generators and, and, and swap out 
um, pour the toilets um, and do things unsustainably, like bringing in bottled water. Um, the Fly Ranch team wants to think through this in a very holistic way and have everything that comes to this place be net positive for the planet and for the people. This is uh, the, the top voted submission called Lodgers. An MIT team. And it's an interesting um, com combination of high tech and low tech. Um, the team used parametric design techniques um, and fabrication technologies um, using recycled materials and locally sourced materials to create these beautiful shelters that merge with the landscape and also very much center of habitats for the animals, the wildlife that, that currently live there. The source is um, an interesting also digging back into solutions from the past. It uses the idea of a fruit wall using rammed earth construction to create that. And what a fruit wall does is it's basically a passive solar um, technology that extends the range of orchard growing uh, seasons. Solar Mountain, pretty self-explanatory, creates this um, interesting merging with the landscape of the, the mountains on the horizon. Uh, generating quite a bit of solar power for the site and places for people to um, to have events. Aqua Plantera is very interesting. It, it is a way to engage the community in an easy to, to learn um, pottery technique. Um, and then inside of each one of these beautiful organic vessels is another custom vessel that is um, using micro pores to, um, to filter the water to a drinkable quality, also providing these little vertical gardens where, um, for, so that it provides um, sprouts and herbs for people to, to use and also increases habitat for um, birds and butterflies, etc. Coop is a mobile hen house that gets moved around the site. Um, fertilizing the soil as it goes, um, providing a, a, a place for the hens to have a good time. These little eggs, also solar powered for the climate control. So it's a fun little idea. And we're really excited that this summer, um, beginning in June, we'll be prototyping on site at Fly Ranch, the top 10 outcomes from Loggy 2020. So it's a direct path to implementation, but the site is very harsh climate. So there'll be functional prototypes to begin to make sure that they can handle the conditions out there and then working towards um, full scale development in the next year. Um, but there's lots of other ways we work and we want to take some time to chat about that. And we also wanna um, bring it back to the big picture. Um, obviously a 100% post carbon energy grid is going to be a mix between centralized remote installations and distributed integrated um, installations and population centers. Um, and more and more research and, and sophisticated modeling is showing that distributed energy resources can actually be more economical. Um, and they're all already understood to be more resilient. Um, distribution infrastructure is even harder to permit than the, the installations themselves out in remote areas. So. Um, the more we can bring um, solar power, especially into the hearts of the places that, it, that the energy is consumed, the better for everyone. And it opens opportunities to engage communities and think about all the co-benefits that can come from uh, an integrated approach to the design process where, where, the, where the impacts are well thought out with the people who are living with these installations. And if we do this right, we can present opportunities for, for, for new wealth generation. We can, because solar investment is a very stable investment um, that performs fairly well over its life cycle. Um, we can create places for, for, for people, enhance the environment, create economic development. Um, you can imagine agrivoltaics in the city. You can imagine use shared land use with reservoirs, parks, riverfronts, uh, streetscapes, and, um, and as, as we've shown through the examples today, you can see that, um, that the, the opportunities for creativity are really endless with these technologies. So what we'd like to see is the silos of energy developer and mixed use um, development for cities to really merge together over the next decade so that we can see the best practices of creative placemaking and urban planning being implemented when um, embarking on new energy landscapes, especially in urban environments. 
And so what that's going to take is the same kind of approach that, that one might take for a neighborhood. Um, you got to first talk to the community, even before you select your sites, to understand the, the complex interplay of variables and the history of these places and their aspirations for the future. Um, create a diverse mix of stakeholders, engage them in the early part of the, of the design process, co-design with them um, every step of the way, and expand the investor base so that it's not just um, Wall Street money coming in and, um, and building our solar future, but everybody can be involved in this process. So this is an extreme example of what may not be the best approach to community solar installation, but this is often what you will see, um, chain link fences, barbed wire, the panels on the ground. It's a, it's a no-go zone for humans. And if this is the standard model that gets implemented in all distributed um, energy resource installations, then yes, we're, we're solving the immediate issue of the carbon footprint of our energy systems, but we're doing a greater disservice to the overall energy transition. And instead, we have the opportunity to think creatively, create beautiful, um, it, it's a great thing to think about the relationship between the Green New Deal and the original New Deal and the Works Progress Administration era of infrastructure. The last time we really did this kind of investment, a lot of artists were engaged in the process. And so people go today to visit the Hoover Dam, not to learn necessarily about hydroelectricity and engineering, but to see the beautiful works of Art Deco art set against the landscape there. And I can imagine, we can imagine a future where people go to visit the installations that will be developed this decade and the next decade to remember this important time in history and to, to see these beautiful designs integrated um, in a way that's uh, holistic. Some of the more community-centered work that we've been developing over the last few years includes solar mural artworks. Um, the project you see on the wall is an elementary school in San Antonio, and that's an artwork that was developed in collaboration between fifth graders and community elders. Um, the film that you're seeing on top of the solar panel does decrease the efficiency about 2%, which we think the trade-off is well worth it um, because murals really offer an opportunity for communities to come together and tell stories and um, be together and share that knowledge with others who come to visit their communities. Um, La Monarca is an outcome um, from a collaboration with a local artist um, in San Antonio and Penelope Boyer, who's uh, been one of our primary project partners for solar murals in San Antonio. Yeah, and the, um, the, the work on the left is actually designed by the students that you see pointing proudly to this artwork. And, um, and this, is a, this is a project that doesn't need a, a chain link fence with barbed wire security cameras to keep it safe because it's from the community um, and there's a sense of pride and ownership that comes with that and a protection that comes with that naturally in space. And we know that some of you will be working in Pittsburgh. This is a project we did in the Homewood neighborhood in 2015 um, in our energy camp. While at that time we weren't, uh, we had not developed our solar mural program, we would probably work towards a solar mural outcome if we were to redo this camp. But this was over the course of six weeks. Uh, we took the students on field trips. We took them to a nuclear plant, to a coal fired plant, and then to various sustainable installations around Western Pennsylvania, because we really wanted them to understand the energy mix of that region. Gave them lessons in energy science, uh, engineering process, design process, art outside of the gallery. It was a really robust six weeks. And during the time they designed and then helped to build a solar sculpture for their neighborhood. Um, and again, this was a strong community effort. Um, the week of installation, what was so fabulous was that the uh, youth were outside helping to install and the local neighbors were coming over and engaging and asking questions and the students really had terrific answers and talked about their process and talked about uh, solar energy and what this installation would mean for their community. So, you know, the outcome was yes, a solar sculpture, but also a lot of project management skills and communication skills. And so the artwork um, powers helps to power the community center there. 
and um, it serves as a, a legacy for, for these young people to, to, to remember and, and learn. They were able to take what was a blight on the community. It was, it was an old dollar store that the marquee was up there and um, it never opened because it was supposed to open in 2008. So, you know, so it was just this rusting marquee with the light bulbs falling out and they reclaimed it um, for solar energy. And so there are, um, countless opportunities in every city with, you know, rusting marquees and old abandoned sites. And, and how can we think about turning those into parklets, places for people um, at the same time as we're really um, point by point um, solving the climate crisis together. So that's where we'll, we'll stop and... And hopefully have time for a conversation before we head off. Amazing. That's so, so inspiring. So great. Um, and that, you know, ending on the dollar store, like it, you know, just these, these interventions in, in our landscape to, to reconnect us to our, our energy and our infrastructure. So great. Student, students, do you have questions for our guests? I think questions about specific technologies are welcome, right? But also approach too. I mean, what an interesting practice these guys have developed to be able to uh, span different sectors and, and the wealth, the library of material that have been developed through these uh, eight international competitions is just like such an asset for anybody thinking about remaking their city for a green energy future. Oh yeah. There's a hand up over here, Ariella. Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, thank you for your presentation. Those were really, really cool designs. I had never seen anything like that. And I'm just wondering um, if you have any sense of what kind of policy work is necessary in the US to begin to implement um, these designs. That's a great question. And we have given that some thought. There are a number of things that we could do that would be easy to implement. Um, you know, many cities already have a one or 2% for the arts program. Those, those programs could explicitly incentivize the creative application of renewable energy technologies or other regenerative systems as media for creative expression. Um, the, the idea of the energy cooperative is one that goes way back to rural electrification and, um, and its, its history is, is one that is as much of American history structurally uh, about a, a lot of inequality um, with a lot of federal funding going to um, white rural farmers for their electrification. And that the model of the energy cooperative is a really excellent tool that is already existing that could be expanded into um, population centers, giving communities uh, the opportunity to create their own, um, basically legal mechanisms to, to be able to, to generate and sell their own power as, as a collective. And so incentivizing the expanding of the energy cooperative model could be a mechanism, a policy mechanism. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I guess the idea of, of providing um, incentive structures for energy developers. A lot of the expense of energy development is the soft costs um, in, the, in, in, in terms of the permitting and the environmental uh, assessments, um, the, the the balance becomes very lopsided when when you when you compare the the what's perceived as a blank canvas, but certainly is not of of a, of a rural site where um, you just lay the panels out in, in nice neat rows versus what the considerations are that are required to bring these installations more into the city. Um, it becomes a little bit more um, about customizing these projects. So if there's a way to, to help developers with the maybe potential upfront additional soft costs that would go for focusing more on distributed energy um, so that, the, so that the, the numbers can, can work out the way they can for larger scale installations, aggregating um, urban solar and the integration projects over multiple sites so that the economies of scale can match those from ex-urban projects is another 
um, way that we can start to address that. I'm going to shift over to Lee's question about uh, ways that we work process and partnerships. Um, it's a great question. And typically we like to have slides that outline all the partners for design sites, but they're a real mix between private and public. Um, so for example, Loggy 2018 Melbourne, the state of Victoria in Australia reached out to us, specifically the Department of Environment, Water and Land Planning. So they emailed us asking if we could bring Loggy 2018 to a site in Melbourne. From that point, um, the very specific design site process, selection process was that we were on the ground for uh, about a month and sort of walking around Melbourne and exploring and trying to figure out uh, what site would make the most sense um, for, you know, a variety of criteria, including um, the access to natural resources. Is it a site where people will participate in a design competition? We're only successful if people come to the table and design for that site. Um, is it a site that makes sense for the local community, um, et cetera? And then once we figure out that local design site within the city, we look for local partners. So the partnership grows from that point on. So we worked with um, an eco center, like an education center. We worked with universities. We worked with arts organizations um, and others to develop uh, local indigenous groups um, and others to really put together the design brief and develop what the outcomes would look like. Burn, of course, for Fly Ranch, the primary partner was Burning Man, so it might be an arts organization that comes to us. Um, but every project is very unique and um, typically driven by whoever originally reached out to us, asking us to bring our program into them. And following up on Ariella's question, just put a link in the chat for everybody. It's something we're developing right now. Um, and we're, we're engaged in um, early conversations about um, implementing the idea in Pittsburgh. So the folks working in Manchester might be interested in looking at that especially, but um, that, that document also provides a lot of um, good links to, to research about the value of distributed energy. Um, you have a hand up, Allison. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I'm just curious what you think um, kind of overall is one of the largest barriers to making these kind of projects actually happen. That's a very good question. There's so many different barriers. Um, it depends. It's all site specific, of course. Um, but I think coming back to the root of it is that um, communities, people aren't engaged until the very end when the developer says, here, we've, we've planned this entire project. This is what it's gonna look like. This is where it's gonna be. And are you gonna approve it or not? And that's the wrong way to, to go about things, as you know. So um, ways to engage the community up front, invest, get them invested in the From day one, successful outcome. As many people as possible. And uh, you know, there's always pinch points. The more people at the table, the more chaos, the more opinions but you've got to get that stuff out of the way early on because it will come later when it's too late. Um, it's going to come at some point. So get those conversations out of the way early on and know that you're going to grow within those conversations, but you have to invite as many stakeholders to the table as possible. Yeah, and cities are where it's gonna happen. Um, it's a, there's a bit of a, a, a roadblock to um, federal level um, and state level um, proactive um, in, engagement on these kind of policies. So, so cities can really take the lead, um, it seems like. And, um, and to that end, you know, going back to what we said earlier, I think that the, um, the one of the roadblocks um, is this, this deep-seated understanding that um, a transition away from old forms of energy to, to new forms of energy will in some way be a sacrifice of, of, of life style and economy. And it's absolutely not the case. Um, so we need to be very, very clear 
about communicating how much better life and more thriving life will be um, once we've completed the transition successfully. One of the uh, underpinnings of my class is discussion about the need for systems thinking to advance uh, sustainable development. And you clearly present a powerful systems framework uh, from inspiration to engagement to contribution, investment, and then protection of the asset. Uh, truly, uh, the whole system approach is apparent in what you're doing. Thanks. And you know, that also comes back to um, the, the question about, about um, valuation, because you know, the, the net present mo a value model for assessing uh, new projects um, often externalizes a lot of the more intangible benefits. And we need to come up with new ways of evaluating projects uh, for their full life cycle and for their full range of co-benefits. So that it's not just about um, what is the power purchase agreement cost per kilowatt hour of this installation, but it also includes what is the overall economic benefit, development benefit of this project? How is it going to increase wealth opportunities for, for the people that live in that community? Um, what is it giving back in, 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 in terms of, of, of culture and art? And um, how is it keeping people, is it attracting new businesses to move to the city? Is it, is it retaining talent in the city? Is it, is it teaching the next generation? Um, all of these things that are potential co-benefits, um, is, it, is it encouraging um, urban uh, organic farming? Um, things that we know are good for us, um, but that just don't get um, figured into the decisions when, um, when thinking about the upfront capital investment. We need a new mindset. <laughs> this issue plays out in so many different environments, uh, even in real estate development. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, real estate developers don't incorporate sustainability is because they're focused on, on uh, front end costs as opposed to life cycle costs. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that um, Victor had a question in the chat, which I, I think is also along these lines about making that case to investors. Yeah. Uh, Kaya? I was gonna ask Victor if he wants to ask his question actually, but I also have one. Victor, you wanna go first? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, Cause like right now in our studio, at least we're getting near like the end of a phase, like our project phase. And then there's a lot of discussion about like how to actually appeal to stakeholders and things. And um, so like, I found it really interesting how you guys decided like, for example, on a waterfall and like a duck. Um, I was just wondering how you guys actually are able to make these design decisions and know like they'll eventually appeal to a public as well as like, how do you actually convince investors that these will are actually good investments? Because I, I, I think like if I go up to someone and go like, I want to have a huge solar panel duck in your city, I'm not sure that'll actually fly with them. So I was wondering how you guys go through this process. Well, on the other hand, the duck, the yellow duck that makes its way around the world um, into ports is a huge success. So it's not really a tough sell the duck um, because you know public art, you can look at a lot of case studies out there, the impact of public art. Um, so that's one thing is do the research so you can show case studies of uh, economic value impact. Yeah, and developers know that their, their development is only successful if there's a sustained level of footfall traffic to their site. And one of the ways to um, secure that is through uh, art in public space. And um, there are good ways to do that that have been shown. And there are, there are some bad ways to do that that have been shown. Um, I'll just throw one out there. Uh, the vessel uh, at Hudson Yards is... Um, had some some mixed success, but it certainly brought a lot of people um, to the, to the development. Um, so there's a, a lot of, of ways that you can point to examples to um, to help convince. Um, from our perspective, um, we're we're mostly working with communities that invite us to work with them, and and by developing a design brief with the community that brings us in, one of the stakehold, key stakeholders being the site owner, whether that's the city or a private entity of some sort, um, co-design the design brief, bringing all those same people together during the selection process so that, um, that everybody who is the decision maker 
has contributed to what the call was, the decision based on the outcomes of that call. Um, and so every step of the way, um, they've been leading the process so that when it gets time to, to make the decision to, to implement and invest, they've already come up with the answer themselves. Any other student questions? I wanted to ask um, that in the time since you started this, the price of solar has dropped dramatically. And I'm, I'm curious whether you've seen this change in you know, more interest in you coming to places and organizing competitions, more people interested in actually implementing energy generating uh, public art. Um, what, is that a noticeable transition for your work? Oh, absolutely. Um, that's great uh, to bring that up um, because the, the cost of solar, well, solar is now definitively the cheapest way to create electricity on the planet. And it's not going to, to um, lose that position anytime soon. Um, you know, 10 years ago when we launched the first competition, that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, and if you go back even further, in, 20, in, in, in 1992, um, when the first like, UN Convention on Sustainability was convened, the, the cost per watt of installed solar was more like $20. And now it's less than a dollar. So that, that's an extremely um, rapid um, drop in, in price. And so in 2019, part of the design brief that we presented for the competition for Abu Dhabi was that we, we said to the participating teams, you can use a $20 per watt installation cost for your proposal. We're going to cap you there because we want to make sure that your, your design is, is possible to implement. But basically the delta between a dollar and twenty dollars, that extra um, that that goes into the creativity, into the culture, into the beauty of the piece that you're proposing. So the, the less expensive per watt to install solar um, we, we get, the more room we have to um, bring in um, these other um, potential co-benefits of, of these installations. Okay, well, we're right on time. Uh, one last uh, call for any student questions, and if not, we'll, uh, we'll move on. Um, Robert and Elizabeth, thank you so much. This was uh, incredibly edifying and hopeful. And uh, I love that phrase about being uh, running to as opposed to running away from. Uh, that really is inspiring. Uh, so thank you again. Thanks for having us. We're gonna jump off. Apologies that we can't be here for the next hour. Yeah. Um, really nice to see you, Thaddeus, and thank yeah. you everyone. Yeah, great seeing you guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye. So amazing work. <laughs> Bye. Okay, so uh, let's queue up team seven. Unless you want, do you want to do a break first? I think we really should avoid a break and, and uh, just go straight through if that's okay with you, Thad and Kaya. Yeah, that's a tough act to follow. So I feel a little bit like, you know, take a deep breath, students. <laughs> All right. They've been at this for a long time. And, you know, you guys are, uh, are going to be great. So just... Uh, <laughs> Does somebody, do I need to make somebody a co-host so they can share screen? Who's sharing screen? Is you, Kai? Yeah, um, just give me a sec. Let me get things ready. Okay. That, that is a tough act to follow. <laughs> but really hopeful and inspiring. Yeah. Okay. So, hi. Um, this is team seven. Uh, we have uh, Hui Ya, uh, Yong, uh, Yue Hui, and uh, me, Kai, as, uh, presenting for Pittsburgh, um, specifically about Manchester and Chateau area. 
And uh, so our project, let's just start with uh, just, can you guys see the screen right now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So why don't we start with the um, basic analysis of the fabric that um, resembles the half century ago, or actually more than that, um, of, of Chateau and, and Manchester and see what really happened. So actually, yeah, my computer. This is. Yeah, this is Chateau and Manchester right now, as you can see, the left side is uh, the, the west side of the highway is called Chateau and uh, Manchester on the, on the uh, east side. And uh, this is the fabric of uh, what uh, Manchester Chateau back in the 1960s. And uh, what you can see from this is they used to actually have a more homogeneous uh, urban fabric with a much thinner grid. And uh, uh, when you remove this historical map and you, you'll be able to see that the, the grid actually expanded a lot to accommodate the industrial use on the, on the west side of, of the highway. So our approach is to examine the, um, the existence of the highway that was put in and to see how that was um, taking up the space and so how we can bring back the, uh, the old fabric uh, represented by our history his context. And also because of the highway, um, the Route 65 is um, basically intersecting the whole, uh, in, uh, as, a, as, a, as a act as a wall that pretty much blocks the way from um, both sides of the neighborhood. So uh, we would do want to create the reconnections that uh, pretty much stitch together the fabrics of both sides. And in order to do that, we actually, uh, Consider this as a reclaim buffer um, that that's currently being taken up by the the run through of the uh, of the Route 65. We would do like to see how we can bring back densities and also create spaces as we call them the aggregated block. So this is just to give that kind of understanding. Uh, maybe someone on my team can um, paste the link to the mural so people can see the. And this is basically our um, the highway situation here. As you can see, this is looking from the uh, over um, area of view from Manchester to Chateau. And you can see from the materials that they basically throughout the most the areas, it's it's totally blocked off other than just this singular uh, opening here. And we did uh, then did a further examination or um, analysis of the neighborhood uh, of the chateau specifically and uh, uh, call out each of the um, in terms of the building and energy uses the green space um, the uh, the building type that uh, the current programs are being occupied with the, the buildings and uh, the number of building floor to examine which which one of these programs should we uh, be keep be keeping um, as we try to reconnect and uh, try to reconfigure the fabrics of, of the Manchester site, uh, of the Chateau site, sorry. And this is, uh, we also took a, look, took a look at the, the water from, uh, or the water edge conditions and, uh, and pull out a, a list of analysis based off the shoreline situations, um, like the natural um, wooded, uh, and uh, the exam the, the level of quality that's um, the display here. Uh, we also look at the current water active water site activities, such as the um, the marinas, the uh, the harbors, the bo uh, the boat clubs that are being currently being utilized. So, Yoko, do you want to talk about how we want to go ahead and reconfigure the uh, the chateau? Yeah, sure. And based on our analysis of the revitalization uh, of the building mapping and uh, what we want, well, which building we want to reserve and which part we want to revitalize. So uh, we just think about uh, we uh, want to like uh, uh, that 
uh, make the, this chateau to the four parts, the four linear parts. The first one is the highway hub, and uh, we have the hypothesis of the for the future, the transportation will uh, decrease to the uh, uh, fifty hundreds of the. Uh, for the current transportation. So the highway will uh, release some uh, green space and the public space for the community. And uh, another one is the compact city. And uh, we just want to uh, compact uh, other buildings into this area so we can release a lot of place uh, in the waterfront. And so the waterfront will be a sustainable uh, area uh, for the uh, for the future and uh, also we have uh, a lot of uh, in industrial buildings were reserved in the in this linear part so the industrial le legacy this part will uh, will represent the legacy of the, the chateau for in the future so when we uh, talk and why we want to make this four linear part is like uh, is uh, focused on like what's the uh, people go go through from the Manchester to the Chateau will have a, a rich experience of the, the spatial uh, the, for the our space. So uh, when 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 they walk from the Manchester to, to the Chateau, it will go through for all of the four four parts. So uh, I, we we just think this is the good experience for the uh, community. Yeah, what's particularly interesting about our approach is here that even though you can see you can see here that we were trying to start slicing these strips around uh, by uh, reconfiguring like the, the linear experience walking from um, the Manchester Chateau, it's uh, actually trying to um, trying to recreate this kind of step in uh, di different experiences as you walk through different slices. So, okay, let's review um, what we have, currently have for the design in terms of the um, design phase. So we, this is the current map of uh, the, our site. And uh, we, this is what we have in, oops, sorry. Yeah, this is what we have uh, in, implemented in terms of the new fabric that's put in. Uh, as you can see from the map that we, actually did a, a road diet by reducing the highway in, into half of the capacity. And then we create a large openings to, from Manchester to Chateau and we create a lot of uh, the public facilities walking through the neighborhood and all the way to the waterfront. We actually created uh, a um, water, water, waterway terminal um, as well as the waterfront trail that comes with uh, um, various waterfront activities. Um, so this is the current opening of the um, highway, which is has a surface for a surface um, drive throughs and without uh, speed uh, without slow down the speed. There's only one traffic light, and the only access is through this tiny uh, tunnel that you can get through from one neighborhood to the other. And uh, what we're trying to do now is create. Um, by decreasing the capacity of the highway, we actually release a lot of spaces and create a public uh, gathering space for a lot of uh, open door activities, such as food truck, as you can see the, the exhibition spaces, the markets, uh, things like that. And, uh, oops. So these are the changes. Yeah, my apologies if I was confusing my teammates by placing my the original image on top. So these, these are the um, the conditions of the when you walk into the neighborhood. You don't do want to briefly talk about that. Yeah, like the, uh, the first perspective shows um, how we transform the parking lot. Uh, we renovated the uh, this energy used parking lot into the public open space. Um, the construction of the infrastructures uh, in the space uh, it's used to increase the retail retail sales. Um, people can do activities and um, shop here. And the second perspective shows um, how uh, how we uh, transform the original building. We are going to make the site space uh, more fragmented and uh, accessible. So we opened up the first floor of the middle of the long building. 
uh, so that people could work through the bottom and also added a pedestrian bicycle path to increase the accessibility um, of the public space. So the, we also have the water from experiences. So this is before and this is after. Um, for the waterfront, since we noticed that Shuttle has many boat clubs and marinas, we think people in Manchester could also have a chance to participate in the fu future water transportation. So this aerial sketch shows what it will look like if Shuttle has a waterway terminal in the future. Um, the government could retrofit the warehouse as the terminal and thinks the community would not want the trail to intersect with the terminal. People will go down to the underground to take the ferry. Um, the station will revitalize the surrounding lots by importing more people so that the community could set up new offices in other retrofit warehouses. Also, the waterfront area will provide more public gathering activities, more rest space, and the increase of tree canopies, which will strengthen the social connection of the community and reduce stormwater pollution. Two minutes, folks. And uh, this is our uh, section for the full experience walking. It's a very long session, apologies. Uh, walking from the, uh, the Manchester side to Chateau. Um, yeah, what do you want to briefly talk about that? Yeah, so when people uh, from the go from the Manchester to the Chateau, the first they will experience from the highway and the highway we will cut off uh, half of the uh, current highway. And uh, so we, release a lot of green space for the public use. And uh, yeah, and uh, the UPMC office building, we reserved the uh, standing here. And also uh, go to next one, we will meet at like the back heaven is also like the expansion, uh, build, expansion building uh, uh, currently standing here. And also the next part is of the industrial legacy part, uh, we will reserve uh, some industrial uh, function here. And the, the final part is the, what Hui has just said, like the water term, waterway terminal and for the waterway to transport to another part from the, on water. So this section just show how, the, uh, how it looks like and how the people will experience uh, when they walk from the Manchester to the Chateau. So the waterway- Based on our new fabric. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. So the waterway terminal actually becomes one of the many that we envisioned for, um, because Pittsburgh is known for have a lot of uh, waterfront like waterfront neighborhoods. So the, if this uh, model becomes successful, we can potentially link them to other parts of the uh, other parts of the Pittsburgh waterfront areas to reduce the need for uh, for vehicle traffic. Okay, so this is a very short, uh, brief uh, introduction for our project so far and progress. Great, thank you very much. It is a, a definite hopeful vision for transformation. Uh, so now I'd like to turn it over to Emily and Lucy who are going to be talking about uh, a public-private partnership for, um, for, entertainment, for an entertainment venue within a green space, which I think fits nicely with this project as well as uh, uh, the uh, the urban art generator projects that we heard about earlier. So uh, take it away, Emily and, um, and Lucy. Can someone make me co-host? Oh, actually, I might have the. Let's see. Can everyone see this? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Can you make perfect. Stop the beginning. Jumping ahead there. All right, um, so my name is Emily Von Lessica and um, Lucy and I worked together on um, this portion of the project. Um, we're actually both SUMA students focusing on corporate sustainability um, cross-registered in the SEPA class, um, but did coordinate together. Um, and I'll allow Lucy to, to introduce herself as well and take over from here um, since she's the kickoff. Cool. Um... So just sort of for quick context, if you want to flip to the next slide, um, on the um, the midterm presentation for project 
uh, for Team Seven, um, they came. They had come up with this concept called the Industrial Renaissance, and I realized that was not part of the <laughs> the last, the sort of most updated version. So, for context, um, we we chose their project. We were really inspired by their midterm um, to create this vision of an industrial renaissance. And something that particularly stood out to me, which inspired my midterm, was um, sort of this focus on. Uh, cultural identity. Um, and I work in the music and art sector. And so that's what inspired this sort of um, uh, to, to create essentially a, a vision for the role that music and arts venues can play in um, helping realize the industrial renaissance vision. So that's where this comes from. So you can flip forward. Um, so 30, you know, and it's amazing how kind of similar this dovetails really nicely into the land arts generator um, uh, project. So some of these things are going to be repeat what they said, but I think it's just sort of shows how sort of great of a need that, you know, arts combined with technology, um, you know, can be really a powerful combination. Um, but, you know, as they shared, um, uh, you know, 30% of um, economically distressed communities nationwide are actually located in these former industrial sites, also called legacy communities who, um, you know, were sort of uh, in, in the days of steel manufacturing and auto manufacturing were sort of at their prime. And then once manufacturing uh, moved overseas, these communities really collapsed and have never really recovered. Um, and Manchester Chateau, um, you know, was a former steel community, um, as you can see from the infrastructure um, and, you know, typical of this type of community has higher than average unemployment rates and um, are disproportionately impacted by climate change and pollution, as you can imagine, um, lots of big warehouses open. Um, open vacant lots, a lot of cement, you know, causes things like the urban heat island effect, and there's a heavy concentration of black carbon from former industry as well as the highway that um, the, the design students showed you. So go ahead and flip forward. Um, but the other thing that these industrial communities have in common is that they all have sort of this really strong history of um, arts and culture. And in fact, in the Manchester Chateau's um, development um, plan, um, they specifically note that they're hoping to attract investment that can not only contribute to the environmental goals, but also preserve and promote the cultural legacy of the area. Go ahead. And so this is sort of presents the case for, well, what is the role that music and arts venues can play um, as anchor tenants to sort of kicking off an industrial renaissance in these communities? Um, and, um, you know, through, through research and just through my work, I know that music and arts venues are, are actually really unique candidates to be anchor tenants, um, meaning that they have this first mover advantage. So where music venues go, they actually attract traffic. They don't rely on existing foot traffic that a lot of other commercial businesses do. And so therefore they can be sort of the first in um, and then other businesses move in to sort of cater to the new audience um, uh, that, that these venues have attracted. Um, it's also well established that music and arts venues are a proven economic multiplier for the reason I just said. Um, as, as Elizabeth and Robert pointed out earlier, um, they have this added cultural and social benefits that are typically not kind of valued, but if you start to sort of look at you know, monetizing that value, there's, there's a greater benefit beyond even just the economic impacts. And then the last point, um, because these venues can be uh, used, of course, for private events and ticketed events, there's a revenue capture opportunity um, that can actually help finance public goods. So for example, um, a city would have to pay to restore a historic building. But if you uh, couple that with a music and arts venue, then the revenue generated from the music arts venue can essentially help finance a public good like the restoration of a historic building or, um, you know, venues that want, I'm sorry, cities that want to build green space or a park, which Emily will touch on, can actually couple that with an outdoor venue and use the revenue to help finance the, the, the construction and the ongoing maintenance of, of that public good, which is the city park. Um, so quick case study. Um, this is actually my hometown, so I had to put it in here, but Bethlehem Steel uh, was the second largest manufacturer of steel. Um, and when the steel industry collapsed, so did the, the local area. In fact, my, my grandfather worked at Bethlehem Steel. And so this is a very sort of personal story to me about the economic impacts that the steel industry's collapse had on this area. 
Um, for, for, for years, the, the city was trying to figure out what to do with this massive uh, steel factory. Um, you can see here, um, you know, it had these, these huge furnace blasters um, that had actually kind of become a part of the city, the cityscape, the city um, um, skyline. And so um, it was decided that they didn't want to tear it down, which was one of the proposals. And instead, what they did is they rallied, the community rallied around, they, they did a public-private partnership to essentially turn it into an arts and entertainment district. Um, because, you know, how cool to, um, uh, you know, see sort of a, a concert with that backdrop of this, you know, sort of historical building that was such a legacy for the area. And um, it's been extremely successful premier destination for arts and entertainment in the Northeast and has attracted over um, a million visitors since its opening. Keep going. And then just another quick case study. This is actually down in Nashville. There was this limestone quarry that helped build uh, the highway that connected Nashville to some of the out outer communities. And when the quarry shut down, um, uh, it essentially became this massive wasteland. It was a brown field. It was used as a dump site. And, um, but again, it was sort of rooted in this history of the area um, and the industry. And so instead of, so what they were able to do, the city was um, use it as a music and arts venue. Um, and, and like how cool, like these, you know, what do you turn a quarry into? Well, it makes a perfect amphitheater for music. And so, um, is, uh, you know, so through the development to create this amphitheater, they were actually able to, you know, clean up the site, which has environmental benefits, remove 900 tons of trash and debris. Um, and the, you know, you can do ticketed events here again. And so the city benefits from that revenue is able to, was able to essentially finance the redevelopment of this old quarry, but while also preserving that, that legacy. Uh, two minutes. Okay, done. Um, so one more slide. So, so really kind of the big opportunity here, um, as mentioned earlier, is, you know, music and arts venues, of course, can also have negative externalities if they're not properly managed. And so um, the role of public policy in this is to really um, reinforce those, those added benefits that uh, music and arts entertainment um, venues can have and maximize those public benefits. So for example, um, you know, promoting uh, when, when, a, when a city is trying to convert an old warehouse, um, promote, you know, sustainability and restorative design. So, and think about that shared code benefit um, where, you know, these warehouse built roofs can really, can be turned into a green roof that actually helps clean the air um, or can be used to generate community, community power for the local residents. Um, you know, couldn't agree more sort of bringing the community in early on to help really kind of think about um, uh, how to design these buildings. Um, and, you know, through joint ownership models, uh, having a community advisory board. So again, there's, there's those co benefits that that should be considered that public policy should should help kind of advance. Um, and again, the unique role of music and arts is it's really about the art of the possible. Um, inherently, that industry and that sector is creative and um, hopeful and inspiring. And so by sort of making that the anchor in these developments, um, it, it can provide sort of that, that positive um, sort of future vision of what an industrial renaissance can, can be. So then I focused on the urban park development of this as um, really anyone that's either been to a live concert or a public park, um, they do coincide a lot. And I also did with that focus on not only the benefits of public parks, but then how to fund them um, specifically in public areas. So quickly just to touch upon clean air, climate resilience and access to nature for all is one of the goals of the Green New Deal. So I definitely did have that in mind um, when thinking about components of this broader establishment. Um, and then the Manchester Chateau region of Pittsburgh, which Team 7 is focused on, um, there are a lot of these environmental um, negatives, urban heat islands, heat concentrated areas, black carbon, floodplains and um, urban parks can be a really beneficial solve to a lot of those issues. Um, so in addition to solving those environmental issues that I mentioned, green spaces do give access to recreational activity, um, increased property values, which spurs local economies that combat crimes, and then of course the protection from the environmental impact. Um, but then funding them themselves, especially in low income areas can be tricky and that's where public private partnerships come in. Um, essentially 
public private partnerships can cover financing gaps that will result from pure public funding. Um, that being, for example, if prices increase over um, the, the lifespan of the project, the taxpayer isn't paying that burden, which as I mentioned, is very, very beneficial um, in, in low income areas. Um, so an example of that is actually for anyone that's currently in New York City or you know has been in New York City um, is the High Line. The High Line was funded by a public-private partnership um, in 1999. Um, that Ray's Railway was supposed to be demolished, but the Friends of the High Line was established um, to help prevent that. Um, they collaborated with five different entities, both public and private throughout um, the New York City area um, and officially established a public-private partnership to help fund the revitalization of the High Line as well as the maintenance of it. Um, with the Friends of the High Line, that being the fund taking on a lot of um, the, the cost burdens, if you will, of the High Line. Um, and it paid off um, by 2013, economic of the benefit, excuse me, of the High Line um, was close to 1 billion. It was only projected to be around a $200 million benefit. So it really brought um, economic and environmental life back into that area. And then another example, my final one that kind of relates back to um, what Lucy all just touched upon and um, ties it all together. While public-private partnerships will fund the creation of parks, for example, it doesn't just have to be Friends of the High Line, for example, it could be a, a private performance venue where those benefits will help fund the upkeep of the park. Um, there are reverse benefits as well. So um, anyone that's been to Boston might be familiar with the Charles River Esplanade as well as the Hat Memorial Shell. Um, the Charles River Esplanade was established along the Charles River um, and then the Hat Memorial Shell came in after that. Um, so not only can performance venues help fund green space, green space can help become um, an entity for performance venues to establish themselves. Um, and then there are those downstream economic effects affiliated with them um, in addition to that. Any questions in regards to either my take on this or um, what Lucy has done as well? Okay, since somebody's jumping up right this second, let's go to Michael so we make sure we have enough time and then we'll do a quick Q&A and discussion at the end uh, for everybody. But the synergy between uh, these two projects is, is palpable and, and truly, truly exciting and it speaks well for the collaboration between our two classes and also uh, the underlying uh, inspiration, the land art uh, generator project as, as just something else that plugs into this kind of integration is is really a hope speaks to a very hopeful future. And now we're going to turn it over to Michael Schumann, who is going to offer a broader national perspective on what it means to effectively develop communities in a sustainable way and bring in local investment and local engagement. Uh, Michael is an economist, attorney, and author, and entrepreneur, uh, and a leading, truly, I won't say, he, he wrote in his bio, a leading, I would say the leading visionary on community economic development. Uh, he's the director of the local economy program for Telesis Corporation, a nonprofit affordable housing company, and currently is an adjunct instructor at Bard College uh, in the New York City uh, office of that program, and also at um, the Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. He is also a fellow at Cutting Edge Capital and the Post Carbon Institute, and a founder, founding board member of the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, also known as BAL. And he is credited with being one of the architects of the 2012 Jobs Act, which I'm sure I'll speak about, and dozens of state laws overhauling securities regulation uh, to allow for crowdfunding. He's written or co-written several books, uh, most recently, Put Your Money Where Your Life Is, and the local economy solution, as well as local dollars, local cents. So with that, Michael, we're gonna turn it over to you. Uh, do you need the uh, PowerPoint or are you gonna uh, uh, just uh, speak? At some point, and uh, so what should I try to take? Uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes? How, how, how long should I uh, hold well, we forth? Run, we, we run till four, so maybe we can leave 10 minutes at the end. Uh, and I'm sure you, if you feel comfortable fielding a question too in the middle, that'd be great too. Absolutely. Uh, so, so if you go to 350, that would be ideal. Yeah, great. Um, so a couple of things. So first of all, thank you for letting me uh, uh, view 
the presentations. Really interesting stuff. And um, over the last year, uh, I have been teaching a course uh, called The New Local, which is uh, jointly developed with uh, a guy named Gilbert roach Coust in Melbourne, who I regard as one of the great placemakers of the world. And what we have found in our work together is that placemaking and local investment actually go hand in hand. And so one of the uh, I, one of the things I wanted to just kick off is just you know responding and uh, to the presentations that you folks just gave. Um, I think there you know you've laid out a really beautiful vision uh, for new directions to move this neighborhood in Pittsburgh or neighborhoods, I guess we could even say. Um, but I think to make this thing come alive, uh, there are two things that you have to do. So one is, is you have to do community engagement in order for the community to figure out what is the DNA, what is the history. Um, there are, you know, some of the history you have built in, but I think some of the history has to be discovered. And there may be, when you think of the diversity of a community, what is history to one group of people is may be very different to another. So thinking about, you know, how can everybody's story have a place in your redesign is very important. The second thing that I think is, is very useful here is trying to understand the economy, uh, trying to understand what, what kind of production and retail and so forth exists there and what is missing. Uh, and I'm going to give you some bigger arguments in a few minutes about why self-reliance is a positive. Um, but, but I'll just say for the moment, um, I think there was a little bit, one of the things that I heard in both presentations is a little bit of the treating of the economy as almost an exogenous variable. But in fact, the analysis of what is the precise nature of demands and the specific thing that I often look at is leakage. How much of local money is being spent outside the community because every dollar that is lost uh, because it is unnecessarily spent outside the community is lost economic multiplier. Now, there's many of the things that you're talking about bring money into the community, tourism, uh, recreation, the entertainment venues, those bring money in, but there's lots of money in the people living there. And how can we make sure that as you are creating new elements of this sort of beautiful picture that you're drawing, you can increase the level of self-reliance in the community. Um, the last thing that I would say is that um, the High Line was and most most economic development projects are very good examples of bringing together public money and rich people rich people in the form of investors or foundations or hedge funds or banks you name it but the truth is is that there's a ton of money that people living in a community have and if you are engaging in kind of working with the public in community development, part of that is to excite people to become investors in the community. So let me just give you a couple of examples of this. So uh, there, is, there is only one team in the National Football League that is not owned by a single obnoxious individual. Uh, can anyone name what that team is? Packers. Yes, Green Bay Packers. Green Bay Packers is a community owned 
mostly nonprofit. It's kind of a complicated structure. But every other football team, because it is owned by this single individual who often is rapacious in attitude, uh, will threaten, you know, if you do not build me a stadium, if you do not give me a couple hundred million dollars, I am out of here and I'm going to move my stadium somewhere else. I'm going to move my team somewhere else. That will never happen with the Green Bay Packers. And that ownership structure has been a tremendous driver for that football franchise and community development around it. Um, let's, let, let's think of some other examples. A community co-op, OK? If you have a co-op grocery store, gro co-ops are different than regular companies because regular companies allocate power, power to elect board members on the basis of the amount of money you put in. So it's sort of $1, one vote. Whereas for co-ops, it is one person, one vote. And no matter how much capital you put in as a person, you get one vote. So they're more democratic. And what you know from, from you know watching co-ops around the United States is that people who are members of the co-op because they get a patronage payment at the end of the year based on their engagement with that institution they they are really cemented there so their investment with their community capital makes them great shoppers at the co-op and they're also great advertisers for the co-op so what lesson do we draw from that the extent to which you can bring the grassroots residents of the, the neighborhood that we're talking about, Manchester Chateau, and get them to invest in many of the features, many of the businesses, much of the infrastructure that you're trying to build, the commitment goes up, the excitement goes up, the shopping goes up, and it is going to be much more lasting what you're going to accomplish. Um, and here's the good news. It used to be extremely expensive and difficult to bring grassroots investors into a project. Uh, that is no longer true. And um, this is a domain that most of you are probably not familiar with and uh, you, you probably don't need to be for quite a while, but it's called securities law. And securities laws were enacted in the 1930s. And here's, here's one little exercise um, that I normally do, since we're not in the same room, I'll just tell you what happens. So I often ask people by show of hands, how many of you have mindfully bought something locally over the past um, week, and all the hands go up. I mean, they wouldn't come to listen to me otherwise. That, then I ask, okay, those of you um, who do banking, how many of you do your banking at a local bank or credit union? And about half the hands go up. Um, and then I explain to people, well, local banks and credit unions turn out to be very important in the sustaining of a local economy. And then the last question that I ask is those of you with pension funds, how many of you put at least 1% into locally owned business? And all of the hands go down. Now this is a very perverse outcome because across the United States, 60, something like 60 to 80% of the jobs and the economy is rooted not in big multinational businesses, but in locally owned businesses, which tend to be smaller and medium size. These businesses are highly profitable, highly competitive, and yet investors systematically invest in the minority of the economy that's global and don't invest at all in the local businesses. That is a market malfunction. And the reason for that malfunction is because securities law thought 
if we could make it more difficult for grassroots investors to participate in the marketplace in order to protect them, that would be a good thing. Well, instead, what happened is, um, flash forward from the 1930s and 40s to today, is now we've made it really easy for grassroots people to put their money 10,000 miles away in the global economy and made it very difficult for people to invest in the kinds of businesses and projects that you are talking about in your work. So we're now fixing this problem. And one of the fixes has been the Jobs Act, which was enacted under President Obama in 2012 which legalized investment crowdfunding. And investment crowdfunding, I mean, the story is quite remarkable because um, in, so it took four years between 2012 and 2016 for investment crowdfunding to actually get all the regulatory framework in place. But from 2016 to now, 700,000 Americans have invested about half a billion dollars into several thousand local businesses around the country. Uh, and some of these businesses are not just businesses, they're effectively real estate projects as well. So these are you know, development issues. And the old rules were that uh, any business could raise up to a million dollars a year and any investor could put in up to $2,200 a year. And we made this path really simple and easy. And the result of four years is that um, the most successful entrepreneurs have been women and people of color. That is those people who the mainstream markets have systematically overlooked and discriminated against have benefited from this democratization of capital. The Good news is, is that this week, uh, in fact, March 15th, the Ides of March to be specific, um, we now have new regulations in effect that have raised the amount that a company or project can raise in a grassroots way from 1 million to 5 million. So lots of things, lots of little bits and pieces of your vision can now be done on such wonderful sites as Small Change. And I want you all, when you have a chance later, to check out the website Small Change. It is the best grassroots real estate site in the country. And guess where it's based? Pittsburgh. So this is a natural connection to the ideas you folks have been talking about. So I am going to. I'm going to pause there for a second, and then uh, after maybe taking a couple questions, I'm going to share some slides. So any questions about what I shared so far? Yeah, go ahead, Lucy. Sorry, can you just, um, can you explain a little bit further that that regulation that just passed? And um, yeah, because I'm interested, but I want to make sure I understand what it means. So, um, 2012, Congress amends uh, the Securities Act of 1933 with what is called the Jobs Act, which stands for the Jumpstart Our Businesses Act, which legalizes investment crowdfunding and allows grassroots investors uh, to participate in a simpler and cheaper way and allows local businesses to start raising money from grassroots investors in a cheaper way. Part of what they did in that legislation is allow for certain of the details to be put in by the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission. And what happened this week is, is the SEC, and this has been happening going on for a while, but this is the week it finally got implemented, the amount of money that a project or a business can raise in this simplified way has been increased from $1 million to $5 million. Um, there are other things that happened in the law too that are really good, but I won't bore you with that now. 
Was that was that helpful? Yeah, and that's any that's any business. Any business, any business, and mm -hmm. and in fact, um, what's what's kind of cool about it is that you know, if you want to raise more, just create another business and another and another and another, and you're building up an audience for these multiple businesses that are part of your project. Michael, can, on that, in that note, can you talk about that deli in uh, Wisconsin that you, you featured last year that has yes. built a network of businesses? Yes, so that's what my slides are on. But before I go there, just any other quick questions and then I'll jump into that. You had a quick question about the keeping money locally and your point about buying locally, but then when you ask individuals, okay, well, where are you investing your money? How would that translate to the corporate sector? I'm thinking either businesses that have headquarters in like in this case, Pittsburgh or just other offices. I know that um, property taxes is of course part of that, but are, are there any other whether it be policy incentives or just incentives in general for companies to bring money and keep money in that local area? Yes, uh, I mean, I think there are. And, and again, if, you if we're talking about the majority of businesses, they're locally owned and they don't move as a matter, you know, they may move like a, a town over at some point if they're really annoyed, but most businesses don't move. So when we talk about attracting outside businesses, we're talking about this teeny global piece of the economy. But yes, there are ways that we can encourage that global part of the economy to do more local investment. Um, and, and, and more local procurement. And so for example, if you go to Cleveland, um, there's a whole initiative underway with anchor institutions there. That is uh, the big hospitals like the Cleveland Clinic and universities and sports teams and government agencies and public schools. And collectively, they're trying to focus their purchasing power on certain targeted local businesses that do local hiring and all help to increase the multiplier. So yeah, bigger companies can be very helpful uh, along those lines. Um, but I do think that that at the end of the day, you know, what we're going to have more influence on is the growing smaller economy. And that's, that's really what I want to share just a couple of um, maybe about 10 minutes of slides on. So hang on one second. So I want to just really talk about four principles for local economic development. And, you know, and as you, uh, the, the exercises you did in your classes this year, you know, won't be the last time you think about how to grow other economies. And I, and I want you to keep these four principles in mind as you're engaged in this. Um, so the starting place really is to understand that um, when you have a conversation with economic developers about how to grow the economy, usually they say our mission is to attract and retain business. And I'm guessing many of you think the same thing that yeah, how attracting attracting business is really good for the economy. And it, there's no question that it is good, but what often is forgotten is that you cannot attract a local business. It's an oxymoron. Local businesses by definition are rooted in the community. And if you're able to attract them, they're not so local anymore, right? Uh, the other thing that's forgotten is that if you're paying a bribe, to a business in order to hold on to it, how deep are its roots in the economy anyway? And this is why studies of corporate attraction have pretty much concluded it's a dead end for economic development. So this is Ann Markison, a professor of public policy at the University of Minnesota. She wrote what I think is the definitive book 
on attraction related economics and her conclusion is incentive competition is on the rise it is costly generally inefficient and often ineffective for winning regions the the word i would disagree with is often because i think it is always ineffective for winning regions and the reason is this the opportunity costs when you look at most corporate attractions now take Amazon, for example, we're talking about several hundred thousand dollars per job. But when you look at local economic development, like uh, I've looked at the guy on the right named Lou Stein, who's a uh, economic developer in Appalachian, West Virginia, Lou has developed, Lou has produced 300 to 500 jobs per year, not for several hundred thousand dollars per job, but for $500 per job. And the way he does this is pretty low tech. He introduces entrepreneurs to banks and he knocks on the doors of existing entrepreneurs and asks them, how can I help? And so out of that thinking, I've really tried to distill four alternative rules for local prosperity, which I'll run through quickly with you. you know, and the first rule is, maximize the percentage of jobs in your economy that are in locally owned business. Number two, maximize local economic diversity. Number three, spread models of triple bottom line success. And number four, create an entrepreneurial ecosystem. So rule one says ownership matters. Ownership of the businesses matters. And this is just another demonstration of uh, the point that I made to Lucy a little bit ago, which is that if you compare two similar businesses, so in this study, it's Central Co-op, which is a cooperative grocery store in Seattle, locally owned, with a similar size chain grocer, the co-op spends twice as much money locally as the chain grocer. And the multiplier impacts of that difference are such that if you were to replace the central co-op with the chain grocer, the city would lose 125 jobs. Whoops. Um, and there have been about two dozen of these studies done over the last 20 years. And they all show that when you compare two businesses that are similar or two industries that are similar, one locally owned, one not, the locally owned business or industry generates two to four times the jobs and other economic development impacts. This is a study in the Harvard Business Review looking at communities across North America. And it had found in those communities with the highest density of locally owned business, there is the highest per capita job growth rate. But not just that, this study from the Federal Reserve in 2013 looked at counties across the United States and found that in those counties with the highest density of locally owned business, there is the highest per capita income growth rate. So in other words, if you wanna raise social equality, lower poverty, having a diversity of locally owned businesses turns out to be the best way of doing so. And of course, locally owned businesses matters for a lot of the other things, some of the things you've touched on in your projects for tourism, for entrepreneurship, for political participation. We know that a local food economy is good for public health. And we know that local businesses are also good for sustainability. There's actually a wonderful um, study that was done by the EPA looking at smokestack industries uh, and what you find is that locally owned smokestack industries pollute about a tenth as much as absentee owned. The only explanation being shame, that when an owner of a local smokestack industry bumps into the neighbors, there is some constraint, some guilt about it, some pressure to fix it. Whereas if you're an absentee owner, you can get away with anything. Rule number two says, we ought to be maximizing local diversity. And I do want to give you an example of how diversification of an economy works and should work. And this is the story uh, that, that uh, Jeffrey mentioned 
Zingerman's Delicatessen in Michigan, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And Zingerman's was very successful, open in the 1980s, and then they had a dilemma. Do we become a chain delicatessen like Schlotzky's? And they decided against it because they didn't want to lose quality control. But they decided, you know what, we need to still grow to hold on to our best managers. But we can do so by growing broad, grow, I'm sorry, growing deep into the community rather than spreading out all across the country. So how did they do that? They used two strategies. The first was to look at their inputs and create new businesses to substitute for those inputs. So for example, they make sandwiches on bread, they created a bakehouse. They serve coffee, they created their own coffee roasting company. They serve ice cream and cheese, they created their own creamery. And then looking at the other side, the products that they, they produce, where were the value adding opportunities? So for example, they serve good food, they could create a sit down restaurant called the Roadhouse. They have great cakes, they could create a mail order cake business. They had great training, so they could train other businesses how to do customer service. So in all, Zingerman's is now 12 independently owned businesses, all local to Ann Arbor. They co-license a brand and collectively they're responsible for 750 jobs there and $65 million in sales. But this strategy of economic development, to go back to the projects that you presented, I would want to know who are the major businesses in the Manchester Chateau region? What were the biggest imports that they had? And how could we substitute for those imports with new businesses in the area? And I'd also want to engage the businesses there and ask them, okay, what are the value adding opportunities that could really help this area to grow? And of course, this is what resilience is all about. One of the major shifts in economic development over the last year is that every economic development agency is saying, we're going to create more local re resilience. Unfortunately, none of them know what they're talking about. And resilience, at the end of the day, is about diversification and self-reliance, which means they have to fundamentally change the way they do business. The third rule is spreading triple or multi bottom line businesses, businesses with high labor and environmental standards. And really the main point here is shine a spotlight on great performers. This is what the B Corp certification process is all about. And if you're in Jeffrey's class, you know all about the B Corp standard, so I won't belabor this. The last thing that rule is really to say, focus on creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And that, you know, as important as all of the placemaking ideas you have for Manchester Chateau, I would add, how do we transform this neighborhood into an entrepreneurial ecosystem so that people are part of this rebirthing process? And in my mind, that entrepreneurial ecosystem contains six P's, planning, people, partners, purse, purchasing, and policy making. So planning means identifying leaks in the economy, all the places where people are unnecessarily purchasing outside goods and services, and expanding the business network in that neighborhood to plug those leaks. People means nurturing entrepreneurs to lead or expand the leak plugging businesses. Partners means identifying and strengthening networks of local businesses that are more competitive as a team than they would be on their own. For example, there in Tucson, Arizona, there are a group of local food businesses called Tucson Originals that collectively buy foodstuffs, dishes, and kitchen equipment. And by buying in bulk, they bring down the prices for all the restaurants and make themselves all more competitive. Purse is about the local investment piece we talked about. Purchasing is buy local and policy making. Well, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about in policy making, but in my mind, 
the biggest problem with policy when it comes to economic development is that um, global companies are given incentives. And what people forget is that when you give money to one kind of company, you're making the other kinds of companies less competitive. Subsidize global business, hurt local business. And guess what? Local businesses are responsible for all of the good things in your economy. So we're supporting exactly the wrong things. So I, we have to fundamentally rethink government participation in this marketplace. So I went through a lot of stuff quickly, but let's, we have probably four or five minutes if folks have any final questions. Well, we, uh, just an interesting point. We have a lot of international students, Michael, and uh, if you can mention a couple more international examples in the next minute or so, if there aren't any questions or that this has applicability globally. Oh, sure. So um, uh, I encourage all of you, if you haven't done so, there, there's a film, actually there's two films that you should, you should look at uh, that are fun to watch. So one is called The Economics of Happiness that was made about 10 years ago uh, by a woman named Helena Norberg Hodge. And the other is a film that was made about five years ago by some French filmmakers called Demain, which means tomorrow. Um, and both of these films contain wonderful examples of the ideas that I just laid out for you about local economy building, about local food systems and local energy systems and localizing manufacturing and creating local self-reliance and building local finance systems, whether through banks or through local investment funds or even local money systems. Um, and one of the things that's been nice is since uh, the Economics of Happiness has come out. Um, Helena Norberg Hodge has organized conferences all over the world where we showcase international examples. So the last conference before COVID hit was in Japan about oh, 14 months ago. Um, and just, you know, you really just saw beautiful examples throughout Japan of food localization and you know, housing innovation um, and energy localization. Um, and then uh, when actually after COVID hit, we did, there was another conference we did in Seoul, Korea. And there we had, you know, a really interesting panel about how co-ops in Seoul have become the leading developers of community-based uh, community economies. Um, so yeah, lots, lots of examples internationally. Another set of examples that I'll give you is uh, from Canada. So Canada has great local investment models. In the Canadian province of New Brunswick, they have a tax incentive for local investment. Every dollar you invest in a local business in New Brunswick gets you 50 cents off of your taxes. Uh, which is remarkable, but believe it or not, the state of Michigan is looking at an identical tax incentive right now. Uh, in, the, in the province of Nova Scotia, they allow neighborhoods to create their own pension funds. In the provinces of British Columbia and Alberta, they allow uh, co-ops to be investment vehicles. So that's how you can create community investment funds. So lots of innovation as you look internationally. Fantastic, Michael. Thank you so much. Uh, by the way, the, the film Tomorrow highlights the Transition Town movement. Uh, do some research on that organization. They're an international organization building local communities. Uh, they focus on the energy descent building communities that are moving away from fossil fuel. So Michael, thank you so much. This has been an amazing presentation. And to the student teams, thank you as well. This whole two hours proved to be seamless and really inspiring and informative. So thank you all for being part of this. Thank Kaya and, uh, and Thad, you wanna have any closing remarks? 
We have more questions, but I realize we're at the end of our two hours and, and we still have a packed schedule following this um, on our own. So yes, thank you, Michael. Um, thank you, that for organizing um, and uh, Jeffrey for putting this like 